Good morning. Another lovely morning, isn't it? And it's lovely down at UCLA, too, <laughs> just to know that we also, they also have nice weather. Can anybody hear me back there? No? I can tell by the looks on their faces they can't. Can you please adjust the mic? Somehow I'll keep talking till it goes up. Is that right? Is it coming through yet? Can you hear me in back? No, there's still no response. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Get somebody, that's my friend back there. He usually sits up here, so he talks to me. <laughs> now he's way back there. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Jacqueline Desoliers. Is Jacqueline here? No, Jacqueline. Sometimes they come in late and come up afterwards, so we have to take three instead of two. <clears throat> Let's see then, is Carolyn Wynn here? Car There's Carolyn, all right, perfect. We'll see you after class, Carolyn. And then we have Kenneth Ruth, is Kenneth here? There's Ken, fine. Well, you'll meet Carolyn, who's just right behind you there. <laughs> so come up after class, please. Let's continue now with our cranial nerves. First, we'll do a little review because we've given them to you several times from different directions, but just to bring them together now. So cranial nerves. You recall we had a forebrain, we had a midbrain, and a hindbrain. Which cranial nerves were dealing with the forebrain? What's the very first one? One and two. How about the midbrain? What cranial nerves are functioning with the midbrain? You can guess at least one. <laughs> three and four. Three and four are both midbrain. So look at then, hindbrain will have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. So you can see when you get an injury in one of these special divisions, what happens when you injure here and how many of your cranial nerves can be affected. And clinically, this is one of the most important things I can tell you, to know where your cranial nerves are coming from. So if you see a peripheral expression of a cranial nerve, you know what part of the brain is having problems. It's the quickest way, all right? So this gives you just the idea of how these are divided. And now what we want to do is just go through them and give their names and brief functions for each. So we have these are specific cranial nerves. And we said one was olfaction the olfactory nerve, and obviously it helps us smell. But I was just thinking about its derivative. If we are adding on our spinal cord with evolution, and one is coming from the most recent part of the brain, and yet you think that olfaction is so important for survival and for sex, and yet it's way up there the last to develop. So the optic nerve is two. Optic, obviously, for vision. And three, what's three? Oculomotor. Oculomotor. What does it do? Oculo, eye, mover. So it will go to four of the six extraocular eye muscles. Four of six extraocular eye muscles. 
So to give you those briefly, here's our eye pupil. We'll have a superior rectus up here. Rectus was straight. You remember it from your rectus abdominis. This is superior rectus. And we have an inferior rectus. Just to make this easy for you, we have a medial rectus. Medial rectus. And we have an inferior oblique. So it's going to be going in this direction. Inferior oblique. So this gives us our four. One, two, three, four extraocular muscles that are all supplied by three. So let's go on to four. Four is trochlear. What does trochlear mean? Pardon? No. <laughs> Good guess, but wrong. Uh, pulley. Pulley, because when you see the trochlear, it works like a little pulley to rotate the superior oblique. So this until you see it, it doesn't make much difference, but once you see it, you'll never forget it. So this is to one extra ocular eye muscle, and it will be the superior oblique. So it's up here. Superior oblique. So we'll put it here for as well. Just repeat, repeat, repeat. All right, so we've got five of our extraocular eye muscles. Let's go to our fifth cranial nerve. What's it called? Trigeminal. It's got three parts. Trigeminal. So we're going to have a motor component, motor five. Does anybody know where motor five goes to? Muscles of mastication. You get lockjaw if you disturb this. Muscles of mastication. What are your muscles of mastication? Pardon? Chewing, that's what it means. But what are the muscles that are having you chew? That's okay. Masseter and temporalis, sure, you've had them. So now sensory, this will be sensory to the face and sensory to the nasal. And what other cavity? Oral cavity. So sensory to the face, we'll just do it quickly, just, whoops, not that quickly. <laughs> Carried away there. So if we take this part, this part, it's trigeminal. This will be the ophthalmic division. This will be the maxillary division. So that's easy, just upper jaw, face over upper jaw, and the mandibular division. Just to give you the origin of the term with its three sensory components for the face. Let's look at six. Six is abducens. 
What does ab mean? Away, away. So what muscle is missing on our eyeball? The lateral rectus, right. So abducens will be the lateral rectus eye muscle. And we can put it in our drawing. It's going to be over here. This is lateral rectus. It's easy. I can't spell it. Rectus. So what happens if we cut the sixth cranial nerve? How can you tell when the person comes into your office that they have a sixth nerve defect? No, just the opposite. You don't have lateral to pull it sideways, therefore medial is pulling, so you have what's called medial strabismus. Can anyone just have one eye do strabismus? Strabismus, you know, is cross-eyed. I can do both together, but I can't do, I frequently get a student. Everybody comes and looks because they can bring that one eye over. But nobody in this class? No, maybe you haven't tried. But anyhow, so injury here, just to give you the dynamics of knowing cranial nerves, will be medial strabismus, medial cross-eyed. Medial strabismus. So you have an eye looking over here. This eye's like that. <laughs> Is that OK? <laughs> Anyhow, you're wise enough to know what it means. But cross-eyed, strabismus. Let's see, we want medial deviation. of I. All right, this brings us then to seven. What is seven? Facial. And we've learned about facial when we had which muscle? How'd I tell you to tell somebody immediately when they come in the office whether their facial nerve is functioning? Nobody remembers? I'm sorry? Pardon? Yes, frontalis. Sure, tell them to wrinkle their forehead, raise the eyebrows. Right? When you see somebody in the morning and you, you can't speak, you just do that and they know you're saying hello, right? <laughs> All right, so that's facial. So we have a motor component. Muscles of facial expression. Review, review, review. We have a sensory component. How many enjoyed that? Being in contact this morning for breakfast. Taste buds to the anterior two-thirds of your tongue. So the sensory component of facial is our taste buds and anterior two-thirds of tongue. When you get your neurology exam, they'll put some different flavors on your tongue and see if you can taste them and you know whether your sensory is fine for the seventh. Let's see, then we have um, salivary glands. The submandibular, submandibular, and submaxillary, you know exactly where they are because of their names. salivary glands. Then we have eight. What is eight? Pardon? 
I hope yours is working now. That's only half of it. What's the other half? Vestibulo. Cochlear. Nerve. Vestibular part for balance. Cochlear part for hearing. Pure sensory nerve, like the visual system. But this is so complex. We think vision's complex. Then it gets us up to nine. What's nine? Glossopharyngeal. So it tells you where it is. What's glosso? Tongue. Pharyngeal, you know now, now you know your pharynx. So this will be going to muscles of pharynx and larynx. Other muscles are going there too. But we're just doing a brief introduction. So how are you going to test this one? Just tell them to swallow. You feel your tongue going back right over your uh, oral pharynx, right? You should be able to now, right? Test. Swallow. What's fun is you get your friends and you go through all of these and test everybody's cranial nerves. Ten. Everybody knows the vagus by now. We've mentioned it so many times. The vagus. The wanderer. So it will go to um, viscera in thoracic and abdominal cavity. We took it to the heart. What was it doing for the heart? Parasympathetic. What does parasympathetic do to the heart? Slows it down. So now we're past, we're up to 11. 11 is the spinal accessory. Spinal. Spinal accessory. What in the world does that mean? For anybody who's interested in evolution, it'd be fun to try to figure out why it has a spinal component to a cranial nerve. It's got to come from the cervical cord, come up in through the foramen magnum, and join the cranial component. So the spinal component is coming from upper cervical Segments of cord, and it joins then with medulla components. And we'll go to muscles in the neck. What's a major muscle in the anterior neck that you've learned? Sternal, sternocleidomastoid. Sternocleidomastoid. And what's a major muscle at the posterior aspect of the neck? Trapezius. So here's a cranial nerve. It's a funny nerve coming back down. Why didn't it just go out to the neck to begin with? Why didn't these just go to the neck? Who knows? 12. What's 12? Hypoglossal. Everybody knows that. I hope so. And the hypoglossal is going where? Tongue. Tell somebody to stick out the tongue, and if they stick it out and it goes, you know that they have disturbed the 
hypoglossal nerve on the left side. There's no muscle there innervated to get it straight. So you tell them to stick out the tongue. If it deviates, it deviates to the injured side. So this goes to tongue muscles. And injury deviates to injured side. Did I ever tell you the story about the little girl in Australia who was 12 years of age and was autistic, never communicated with anybody? Did I tell you that little story? No, very quickly then, because somebody knew her cranial nerves. A nurse did. And they were at a meeting, and this little girl was there, and nobody had talked to her. She hadn't talked to her back again. And the nurse said, if you hear me, stick out your tongue. She knew her cranial nerve. She went down the spinal cord, uh, down the brain stem as far as she could with the cranial nerve, and the little girl stuck out her tongue. That just opened the whole thing. About 10 years later, they wrote a book together. So know your cranial nerves. Very simple, simple and important. OK, with that, let's go to our spinal cord. And don't sell your spinal cord. <laughs> it's so important. Many people want to be neurosurgeons because they think they're going to be brain surgeons. But very little brain surgery actually takes place in case of tumors or accidents. Spinal cord injuries are common. That will be the bread and butter of, this is what the neurosurgeons tell me, of tomorrow. It's operating on the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is found in the vertebral canal. With its meninges, its coverings. Those are the CT coverings. In the embryo, the cord fills the entire length of the canal. Entire length of canal. At birth, how much does your cord fill? And I always ask that because I've seen it on medical boards. How far does the cord go at birth? You think this, these are trivial. Almost every statement has meaning somewhere, right? So at birth, cord to L3. In your bodies, adults, where does the cord go? Between L1 and L2. There's a differential growth between the vertebra and the cord. And this is why you keep getting this cord going up as the vertebra are growing rapidly. So in the adult, it goes to L1, L2. So now let's introduce the term cauda equina horse's tail. Did you know you had a horse's tail? But it's made up of nerve roots. Cauda, that's tail. Equina, horse. And it's made up of nerve roots. Why does it exist? If I have my cord and I have my segments, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, 
sacral, and coccygeal. How many cervical nerves? Eight. How many thoracic? Twelve. How many lumbar? Five. How many sacral? Five. Okay. How many cranial nerves total? How many? 31 what? Pairs. So how many coccygeal? Just checking you. All right. One coccygeal gives us 31 pairs. Now, we have a vertebral column. I'm just giving representative samples here to get the idea across of what causes our cauda equina. And these represent vertebra, these little boxes, because I've got to get my spinal nerves to go out so forth. So when I'm at the cervical and thoracic level, my nerves can come out and just go out like this through these. But as I get down further, these will go down, and then to get to these, these will go down, and these will go down, and so forth. And by the time you do this bilaterally, you can see where this horse's tail has come in to this area where this is at L1, L2, where the cord has stopped. But the nerves, in order to go out through the intervertebral foramen, these are nerves in intervertebral foramen. They form what's called the cauda equina. Does that look like a tail to you? I'll show a picture and you'll agree that it does. Cauda equina. So that gives some basics about the cord. Let's look at the protective coverings of the cord because they play a very important role. We saw some of them and what they do in the brain when you got your dura mater forming sinuses. You saw how it became modified in the skull. Let's look at meninges in on the cord. Let's do on the cord. And very simple again, because we won't be following them out on the nerves. We'll just be getting the basics. So here's our conus medullaris, which is the end of the cord. Conus medullaris. What level is it? L1, L2, right? That's where it's ending. L1, L2. And we'll see why that's very important to know. You can count up from your sacral lumbar joint for five, and then you get where L1 is, so you know where your cord ends. But now, we want to put on our three layers. We are going to have pia mater, arachnoid for spider, and dura mater. What did we say pia mater meant? Gentle mother. What did we say dura mater meant? Harsh mother. So let's put Pia in yellow. Pia is adherent to the 
exterior of the CNS, whether it's brain or spinal cord. It is protecting. We said it formed a peel glial membrane, if you remember, to protect when you get something sharp entering your nervous system. So the pia mater is adherent to spinal cord. And then we have the arachnoid. Leave space between the pia and the arachnoid. So in pink, we've put in the arachnoid membrane. And it has Trabeculae, remember trabeculae? You've seen those in your uh, lymphatic organs, networks of fibers connecting the arachnoid to the pia. And these trabeculae, that's what gives it the name spider for spider web. For arachnoid spider. What flows in the sub-arachnoid space that we've created between the arachnoid and the pia? Cerebral spinal fluid. So CSF flows in subarachnoid space. That cerebral spinal fluid. Do you know how much CSF you produce each day? 700 cc's. Think of that. It's all got to be reabsorbed every day. Isn't that phenomenal? How active it is? All right, so our outer membrane now is going to be the dura mater. And the dura mater is, you've seen it, it's heavy, thick, connective tissue, protective membrane. So in green, we put in our dura mater. It's thick, bathing cap-like, thick CT membrane. And what's important here is that the dura mater continues on down to sacral to. S2. And what it's formed here, the cord ended up at L1. We're down at S2. We have a sac. It's called the dural sac. And what's it filled with? Look at it. CSF. Has anybody had a spinal tap? Oh, heaven forbid. One person, two of us, spinal taps. So they have to count down to be sure they're lower than L1, L2 to put the needle in to draw that spinal fluid, right? But you see the importance of knowing that you won't hit cur the cord there. You'll hit the cauda equina, but they usually move aside when you go in with the needle. So this is a level for a spinal tap. Or spinal anesthesia. They can put the anesthesia there for 
delivery for birth so that you just get the lower part, not the upper part. All right, all of these play a role. All right, so that's our, our meninges. Now let's look at a um, cross section of a spinal cord. I told you I had a student. There's the thoracic area gets tumors more frequently than the rest of the cord. Nobody seems to know why. She had a tumor in her thoracic cord. We followed her. She kept having it removed. It kept coming back. She eventually died. But she sure was a good example to let you know that some parts of the cord form tumors more frequently than others. Why? Lots to learn. So we want cross-section of cord. Oh, let's take our old familiar part first so you can see where the cord segments are derived. Let's take an embryonic section. sure you remember this, right? We'll do it like this. What do we call the center of our cord here? Hmm. What is it? Gracious. What's the first part going to be? Pardon? Central canal, sure. Thank you. Does anybody remember what the central canal is lined with? You're going to get all of this because you can get tumors of these cells. So in green, we have our ependema. Ependema. Lining central canal. Can you see your spinal cord back there? Have you ever tried to imagine it? Ever thought of your dural sac? We call what I've put in red here the mantle layer. And the mantle layer consists, whoops, primarily of nerve cell bodies. So we call it what? Gray or white matter? Gray matter, sure. And it's surrounded then by the marginal layer, which is marginal layer, which will be fibers then, nerve fibers. And they're myelinated. So what do we call this? white matter. Fat is white, right? So these are myelinated fibers. We'll show pictures of demyelinating diseases, taking away your white matter. So now that's the way we see it in the embryo. But you've been told that you lose about 50% of your neurons before you're ever born. During embryogenesis, many more neurons are formed than you'll ever need. They're precious, they're overproduced. So if we look at a cross section of the adult cord,
You think you'd like to find out how to hang on to all of those neurons so you don't lose them? You want all those or you want choice ones? So let's put in now our adult cord, which, where we're going to change our configuration completely. And now what do we have? We have our green. Our central canal is reduced to a very minor structure, but it's still present. There are some diseases that affect only the tissue around the central canal, so you need to know it. Central canal. Then we have our mantle layer has been changed into what we call horns as we see them in a single cross-section. So you see how many nerve cells have been lost in the spinal cord because originally this was all a circle. But that area which becomes functional stays. So this is going to be our posterior horn. And this will be our anterior horn. Sound familiar? Anterior horn cell? What did we say about anterior horn cells? They're the largest, right? 135 micro. And we said we'd see them eventually. These are your big motor cells that are firing for me to write on the blackboard. But now we look at our marginal layer out here, all our white matter. And that will be our white matter. So we see the gray matter has a specific form, so does the white matter. But now how are we going to make this functional? Is our posterior horn going to be sensory or motor? Sensory. sensory. Good for you. Right. Because we showed it very early that if we took this across here, this was sensory and this was motor, right? Your ailer and basal plates. So this will be sensory now. And our anterior horn will be motor. We told you the polio virus attacks these anterior horn cells. You get paralyzed with polio. All right, now what we want to do is see how the input comes, makes use of this sensory and we'll make a simple sketch then. cross-section of our cord again with our horns. And this time we're going to introduce our dorsal root ganglia. Familiar friend. Dorsal root ganglia. group of nerve cell bodies outside the CNS. It's over there. Chain of ganglion alongside the cord. So now we want to bring an impulse into the cord. Let's just take a reflex. It's not going to go to the brain. It's just going to go in and out. So let's have a pin out here. It's going to prick your finger. It hurts, pain. <laughs> you have, 
we are silly sometimes, but uh oh, there goes our time. <laughs> I do want to take this in, so the pain's going to go. Tr pain's usually travels much slower than this, but we'll take it in just because we've got it set up. Here, what kind of nerve cell do we have in a dorsal root ganglia? What kind of nerve cell is that? Pseudo unipolar. Good. I, t I told you, I heard a PhD exam and the kid didn't know it, and boy, he got in trouble. It seems trivial to you, but when you work in the field, different viruses will affect this cell that won't affect this one. So you learn them. You're just getting your introduction. So here my pain is coming in, and it will go over what's called the dorsal root here, between the ganglion. So you can go in and cut the dorsal root so that you don't get pain when you get terminal cancer and it hurts too much. So you need to know these things. And then we have an interneuron. What do we say about interneurons? What are our three types of neurons? Motor, sensory, and interneurons. Interneurons. They connect the two. Most of the nerve cells in your central nervous system are interneurons connecting what's coming in and out. And now we have our anterior horn cell and it's going to come out and it's motor so it's going to come out to some skeletal motor, motor skeletal muscle fiber and you'll have an action. And this is your ventral root. Certainly don't want to cut it ever. Let's show slides. But that gives us a simple pain in, motor out. All right, this is our familiar one. Here's our forebrain, our midbrain, and our hindbrain, right? Familiar? Are you with me or are you too busy packing? Okay, we had one and two up here, forebrain, three and four mesencephalon, and all the rest from the hindbrain. Here it shows two coming out from the forebrain to form the optic cup, which will be your retina. So it's of neural origin. In the next one, and this shows that within the brain, these are what we call optic tracks, but the optic nerves will be coming in from the top of your nose, olfactory impulses. These are your optic nerves. These are your third nerves. Your fourth nerve comes out on the opposite side. Here's the fifth. Six is here. Seven and eight are here. This is called the pontine cerebellum angle, a frequent place for tumors. And then you have 9, 10, 11, and 12 coming out here. In the next one, and this just shows the continuity of the brain. You can't have a brain transplant. What's going to happen when you cut off all this input from your total body? You can transplant pieces, but even those haven't been too successful. But you can see the nerve roots coming out here and the cauda equina here. In the next one, this is showing the dorsal root ganglia in the intervertebral foramen, your sensory ganglia. In the next one, and this shows the coverings. This is your heavy dura mater, the arachnoid, and the pia will be clear down here, and this is a pia attachment laterally. In the next one, and this is the real thing, but again to show the cauda equina. In the next one, and this shows the cord that in the cord, all of these are 
ascending fibers, white fibers that have come in, going up to the brain in red, the descending on the opposite side. So next time we're going to fill in a little bit of the cord so you can see what transpires and what can be cut and what can't be cut in case of too much pain or too much of other sensory mechanisms are firing in the next one. And this shows multiple sclerosis, a small area of demyelination in the posterior lateral portion of the cervical cord. So here's our gray matter, here's our white matter, and in this lateral area, it's demyelinating. There'll be specific functions. Look at this, this is multiple sclerosis with extens extensive lesions occupying practically the entire cross-section of the spinal cord. That's something. In the next one, and this is just to show tumor formation. We'll put in things occasionally, so we'll ask you symptoms if you have a tumor. Here, this is pons underneath. This is cerebellum. You've got this big tumor growing here. What might you see? In the next one, I think that's it.